Well, you might remember that last week, Governor Ron DeSantis announced his plan to work with the Trump administration to be able to re-import Canadian drugs manufactured in the United States uh, and uh, be able to save money in the process. He said he was going to work with the Trump administration. Not sure what that means quite yet, uh, but also now Congress is set to square off against pharmaceutical CEOs, and uh, we're going to check in with Seth Denson. You may follow him on Twitter, at Seth Denson. All right, so uh, first, for these congressional hearings are going to take place with pharmaceutical CEOs over drug prices, do you anticipate anything of substance happening here, or is this simply going to be congressional soundbite material where they say, hey, listen, I, I talk tough and beat up the, the pharmaceutical guy? This is kowtowing at its best, Brian. I mean, listen, I, I, I tend to question the people who are – uh, overseeing this hearing when, in total, the Senate Finance Committee has received over $2 million in PAC money from pharmaceutical companies, and these are the people asking questions. <laughs> uh, so what you're saying is uh, they already had their arrangement in place during the election cycle, and uh, the, the CEOs go in here knowing where their loyalties ultimately lie, and they're just going to sit there and take their beating? I mean, I wasn't in the room, but I can imagine how that conversation went, where it was, hey, guys, we're going to have to pull you in. We're going to have to beat you up, but don't worry. We're going to do it on a busy news day where we got Brexit vote going on and all this other stuff going on, but we're going to beat you up. Uh, but in the end, we're not going to do anything. Listen, if Congress really wanted to get serious about changing the pricing of pharmaceuticals, Brian, they could do things around FDA requirements uh, to get new drugs to market, patent extensions, allowing foreign markets to sell drugs here in the U.S. I mean, there is a ton of things they could do that, are, that would seriously change things. But the pharmaceutical companies, they're just playing by the rules of the game that are out there. And until we change the rules a bit, they're doing what they need to do. Yeah, Seth, I, I wanted to ask you about that. Last week, our Governor Ron DeSantis announced his plan to import drugs from Canada. And if you take a look, the average savings on the top 20 drugs that are prescribed in uh, the in Florida, uh, they are 45% cheaper in Canada. So without a doubt, if we were able to do that, there would be savings. I, I know that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Do you think that if we were successful in being able to import Canadian drugs, that we would ultimately see significant savings? There's a couple of key things that that would do. We would see savings specifically on certain drugs that maybe have different patent protections in Canada and or are even drugs that are manufactured in the U.S. and sold in Canada for a much lesser price and then sold back, could be sold back here. Um, listen, the United States is responsible for 70 percent of the innovation when it comes to drugs, but we charge double what the rest of the world does in most cases, and, and that's because we can. And so we've got to allow for free trade to work appropriately. Capitalism works best when the consumer has the power. Give the consumer the power and allow these markets to change how they operate. Speaking with Seth Denson from GDP Advisors, Seth, you, you say when markets operate, what specifically do you think our government has done to create additional obstacles that inhibit the free market from working? Well, a couple of things. For example, I'll just use Humira, which is a drug you can't turn on your television and not see a commercial uh, for Humira. Humira was approved in 2002, and it's had so far 21 years of exclusivity because the government continues to allow for its patent extension. And it, so it shores up the oppor or eliminates the opportunity for any drug manufacturer generic to bring a generic to market. And this is not, I mean, I'm not just beating up on Humira, it's just the one that's mostly known by every company is doing this, and the government is allowing it to happen. They're just continuously allowing for pharmaceutical companies to do this. And the other thing is this is a new game that's being played by pharmaceuticals is taking two generic drugs or even over-the-counters, mashing them together, filing a patent on the combined drug, so let's say metformin and Aleve, and charging $2,000 for it and getting a patent for it. Well, that's like me taking peanut butter and jelly and sticking it in a sandwich and saying, well, I took two total opposite process products, stuck them together, and now I want a patent on PB&J. And what role does insurance play in this process? A massive role, man. They own, the, they own the distribution marketplace. So the pharmaceutical benefit managers, or PBMs, uh, which negotiate the buying and selling of drugs in the United States, 70% of those drugs 
are distributed by one of three PBMs, all of which are owned by the insurance company. So the insurance company is getting a kickback on the back end based on the inflation rate of the drugs. And so this, we talk about collusion all the time these days in the news. You want to look at collusion, look at today's healthcare system and watch how ind- insurance industries, big pharma, and pharmaceutical benefit managers are all in alignment one with the other. All right, good stuff. Appreciate the uh, the answers, the insight. Uh, Seth Denson, GDP Advisors, follow him on Twitter, at Seth Denson. And uh, once again, you, you see how the insurance first model creates so much of the inequity in the marketplace. We're going to do a bit of a follow-up. I already have a, a really good question on this topic that I want to address. So uh, we'll get into that a bit more tomorrow.